Today, we're joined by a college football legend, Bryce Love, 2017 Heisman Trophy finalist, Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year, Doak Walker Award winner for the best running back in the nation. Uh, it was an awesome conversation with just a great guy, amazing leader, talking through his football journey. So I hope you enjoy. I definitely did. All right, we are back with a big one today. We got a Stanford legend, Stanford royalty, Bryce Love. Bryce, thanks so much for jumping on. Hey, man, Brown, appreciate you having me up here, man. I'm happy to be here, happy to talk things out with you. I mean, I could do the accolade awards intro for your athletic career, but it would take the whole hour, I think, to get through the awards. If you look at your Stanford file, it's never ending. Um, I wanted to take it all the way back and start in youth football, in track and field, hear about your kind of youth days. When I think about a player like you, I oftentimes wonder, how did you ever get out there and play on a, on a level playing field with fellow you know, 12-year-olds? Tell me a little bit about your Pop Warner days. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, so what I'll say is uh, growing up, I definitely wasn't, you know, I wasn't like an athletic freak or anything like that. I was definitely more so had a little pot belly, you know what I mean? A little chubby. <laughs> running around. I played O-lineman a little bit when I first started playing flag football back in the day. But, uh, you know, my parents, my, you know, my dad played football, my uncle played football. So I already kind of had that foundation. You know what I mean? I, I used to talk about back in the day, um, you know, my dad would play the Steve Sable football clips and NFL films, all the classic stuff all the time. And then when I got the opportunity to go out there, you know, it, it was pretty competitive. I, I ain't gonna lie to you. Um, so I played O lineman probably the first two years, and then I kind of switched into, you know, more of a skill position. But even then, you know, I was wasn't an athletic freak. I wasn't really bigger than anybody. I wasn't outrunning a bunch of people, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, so played flag. We didn't have uh, tiny mite or anything like that for the most part. So we just transitioned to, I want to say back in those days in North Carolina, it was called mighty mite, something like that. But uh, so we switched up to that, started playing. My dad was my one of my first head coaches, uh, Coach Marshall. Also, you know, my best friend's dad also was ended up being uh, one of my head coaches along the process. He played with the Broncos. So he kind of helped guide us along the way. And really, I mean, it kind of just all clicked one day, kind of started to put together some things and um, yeah, was able to really get get competitive out there. I mean, being from North Carolina, we had a lot of talented guys. So uh, we all kind of just came around at the same time. And uh, it, it was a nice little competition to build off of. Kind of hilarious that you said you weren't an athletic freak as a kid when, for everyone listening or watching, this is a guy who, as a in 12 and under and 13 and 14 under, had the national record for fastest 100 meter, 200 meter, and 400 meter. So I think you may have been uh, downplaying that a bit. Nah, see, it, it clicked eventually. I ain't gonna lie. It clicked probably around that time. Around that time, we used to have a track coach. Her name was Coach Vern. And she was the first one to really get me into the sprints. Um, this is, of course, I was probably nine, 10 years old at the time. And I was always one of those kids, you know, I wasn't an athletic freak, but I had a lot of energy to run around and just do stuff in general. Yes. So kind of just focusing that energy into, you know, running on the track, getting that energy out. My parents got tired of me running and jumping around the house and it kind of translated for the most part. It kind of, you know, you run track to learn technique and um, get in shape and run faster and faster. And ultimately it paid off for sure. That's something that you and obviously who you ended up being a one-two punch with at Stanford, Christian McCaffrey, both of you guys started with a lot of track training. Talk about how that translated and helped you down the line with football. Yeah, man. I mean, Christian, I'm pretty sure would tell you the same thing. I mean, it's really, for me personally, it helps you just be more efficient in and out of movements. Uh, above all else, I mean, being able to get that stride and going, being able to... Um, really learn how to run in an effective way. A lot of people, you know, I mean, that's for me, track was one of my first loves as well, but a big positive to it is of course, you're going to learn really the fundamentals of how to run, how to run efficiently, how to um, pick up speed, 
how to really hold top end speed, all that good stuff. And it really translates directly to the football field uh, for the most part. So it's one of the big things that I always refer to that I would always recommend, you know, kids and younger people to all get into. But I think it's one of the big things that contributed to the success that I ultimately ended up having. And I'm sure Christian would tell you the same thing. Did you run track all the way through high school? Uh, somewhat. So I really, I kind of transitioned away from track my freshman year of high school just because, um, you know, over the summers, you got summer conditioning, summer yeah. workouts with football, um, really getting in the weight room, all that good stuff. And it really, you know, started to be hard to really balance both of them since they were really going on at the same time. Uh, I still did. From time to time, I did a couple meets, did a couple high school meets, but definitely not to the same focus and level as I did uh, in my younger days, for sure. And your high school, did you play for a powerhouse? What was the program like? Were you were you guys crushing every team or was it? Nah, so we we were competitive. I ain't gonna hold you. We were, we were competitive. Uh, so I, when I was in high school, it was called the the Cap 8 Conference. And, you know, we had a lot of local talent. That's what I will say. You know, me and uh, Trent, who was up here earlier, too, we always go back and forth about what the best state is uh, for football. <laughs> and uh, so I'm I'm big on North Carolina, man. I'm going to be honest with you. Really? Had, I mean, just off the top of the, you know, top of the dome. I mean, we had, uh, you know, Trey Jones, Marcus Jones, uh, Petey Williams, um, Devontae Reynolds, my brother, uh, Chris Love. And that was just at Wake Forest. And all these are guys who were doing amazing things that may not necessarily have had uh, the opportunity to really go to the next level, but they had immense talent. And really what I always contribute to really bringing stuff to the area is, uh, you know, one of my really good friends, Keith Marshall. Uh, so he was well, number one running back in the country. I want to say this was back in the 2012 time frame, summer 2012, 2013. And once he brought, you know, recruiters and stuff like that to the area, I mean, you know, you see guys like Braxton Berrios, um, mm -hmm. Naheem Hines, Dexter Lawrence, who was my teammate. Uh, and that's just a handful of the guys that I got to see firsthand. And um, yeah, man, I mean, we played some competitive games, man. We had a lot of talent on those teams, but, you know, it was, it was a lot of talent also in the area as well. You know, Leesville, like I said, um, they had Braxton, uh, Gardner had Naheem Hines. Um, I mean, Wakefield had, you know, Connor Mitch and, you know, some other really good talented receivers. So it was always competitive. We made it to the state championship game uh, two years in a row. I want to say my my junior and senior year didn't end up winning them. But, um, you know, we, we were always in some dog fights, man. And it was tough out there. Wait, I was just I need to back up for a second. How yeah. depressed were your high school track coaches that the fastest 12 year old in American <laughs> High school history or whatever yeah. middle school history yeah. <laughs> wasn't gonna run for him. Nah, so I mean, I I did do uh, spring track. I did, okay. you know, it was still not necessarily to the degree. I mean, I competed in in states from time to time, but you know, I that's one of the regrets I have too is I just didn't have that same kind of focus at that point. Yeah, um, you know, because football was my first love. I loved track too, but football was really what I ultimately wanted to do. And uh, so once, you know, recruiting and stuff like that picked up in those times, you know, you had to go to camps, you had to do all this other stuff as well. So it was, it really just got to the point where it was tough to balance both and kind of had to focus in on one versus the other. And um, yeah, but I mean, I, you know, I still was out there, you know, competing in some meets, running a couple 400s every now and then. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was still a balance. We ran relays. So we won states in the four by one one year so uh i'll take that that's a win yeah okay so you didn't completely break their hearts that's good yeah yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't a complete heartbreak it wasn't nothing too crazy okay and you mentioned your brother talk about him a little bit tell me about how i can only imagine two brothers playing at a high caliber you must have pushed each, pushed each other quite a bit yeah yeah so i mean uh my brother i mean obviously you know growing up that's who i looked up to uh you know he really uh, set the way for me. So he's two years older than me. So we're close enough to, you know, have similar experiences, but he always paved the way, led the way. Uh, a lot of times, you know, 
we just talk about different things. So I might not necessarily do the same thing or do the same thing. You know what I mean? Just so I can have that same level of success. Uh, so obviously, you know, we wrestled all the time, played outside, competed all the time. And all the things that, you know, I ultimately wanted to do were all things that we talked about together, uh, planned for. And it was really, you know, it was a blessing in itself to be able to see him. He ultimately uh, worked for a scholarship at ECU and seeing him, you know, still go out there and compete and accomplish the things that he really wanted to do was, and, you know, it was amazing to me. I remember being out in California watching his games when they came on TV. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's definitely the reason that or a big reason, if not the reason that I was able to get to where I'm at and, and to achieve a lot of things I was able to achieve. So your brother, you know, ended up staying on the East Coast, East Carolina. Yeah. What was the recruiting process like for you? You mentioned there were some other studs in your area and even on your team. So clearly coaches were, you know, knocking. Who yeah. were some of the guys who came by? What was that process like for you? Yeah, dang. So uh, I always talk about, you know, we kind of talked about this a little bit uh, off, or, off record, but my big thing was, uh, you know, I had a couple different opportunities on paper, but it wasn't the situation where, you know, I could really commit and go to these places and do all those kinds of things. Uh, I will say, like I referenced earlier, um, in my mind, you know, Keith helped bring a lot of attention to the area. And from that, you know, I was able to get a couple opportunities from local schools, um, you know, the UNC's, NC State, Duke. Uh, beyond that, had a couple out-of-state schools, uh, Stanford being the biggest one for sure, or one, you know, one of the most important. Uh, I want to say it was, had like a Florida maybe in Arkansas were the other two ones that were really uh, in consideration, or in Tennessee. So those, honestly, uh, and my, well, just to rewind the tape a little bit, going into it, you know, you, we always went through different training sessions and all that good stuff, uh, to prep for the different combines and all that good stuff that would come up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we of course did the Nikes, we did the rivals camps, uh, a couple of different local college camps, all that good stuff. And really it started building in. I want to say around my sophomore, junior years, when opportunities started to to come in for the most part. Uh, one of the first ones being Stanford. Uh, Stan, you know, Coach Taylor. He's um, the head coach now. Uh, he was the one who was the main recruit from Stanford at the time. But then, you know, throughout the process, uh, Coach Tavita came by, Coach Bloom, Coach Morgan, a, a bunch of. People came to like the in-house visit, all that good stuff. So that was a really big sign of love. And to me, you know, it really came down to UNC, Tennessee, and Stanford. Um, you know, UNC at the time, unfortunately, was going through, you know, they had that transition. They were in a little bit of academic trouble. Uh, Tennessee was Tennessee. It was still kind of a similar situation where they were transitioning between coaches. Uh, Coach Gillespie, you know, he's down at Alabama right now doing big things. Um, and then, of course, Stanford was the big one that really just was the perfect fit for me. And, you know, it was definitely tough to go five hours away from coast to coast, but it was a good experience and it, it was, of course, the right decision. Yeah, and, and you mentioned some of those offers. Because if you look at your rivals, your 24-7 page, you had offers from Georgia, Florida, Ohio State. Like yeah, yeah. these are some big schools, but what you kind of hinted at is something that I spoke with Brady White about actually, who's now a coach, yeah. and it's the concept of like an uncommittable offer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's something yeah. that a lot of people don't realize is absolutely a thing in the recruiting world. Can you mm -hmm. shine a little bit of light on that? Yeah, I mean, dang. So how I guess how I thought about it initially, or the perspective I think about it in retrospect, at least, is just that you're a guy that they would take if somebody else doesn't commit one of those type of situations. So, you know, it might be where they have their number one guy, they have their number one through 10 guy. And then yeah. you might be the 11th guy yeah. that none of the top 10 come, then you're good. But uh, if not that, then uh, 
yeah, I mean, that's pretty much at least how I rationalize it at this point. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, Brady mentioned it as well, but it's just one of those things where you don't really know until, you know, you might try to reach out and ask for another visit or ask for an official visit or Start ask to get a for, sense. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To really get that kind of confirmation and whatnot. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so it's just, it's one of those things where you'll definitely know when somebody's really wants you or somebody who's just kind of, you know, just staying in touch, spinning the block, you feel me? So what did your parents, your brother, all your family, friends, I'm sure they were saying, stay home. We want to be closer, <laughs> go to UNC, go to yeah. Duke, at least go to maybe Tennessee if you want to really go yeah. west. Yeah. But what, what were they saying when you were uh, making that decision? How did they try to influence you? And, and what were some of the conversations you had? Yeah, nah, I mean, so, well, me personally, I'll say I didn't really know much about Stanford, you know, being from the South. I knew about, you know, the big schools, Georgia, Keith went to Georgia, uh, the Alabamas, they were dominant at the time, Florida's, all that good stuff. I knew about all that, but um, I didn't have that deep understanding of Stanford and the academic prowess that they had. So I think for me and my family were really when we went out there for the first time, we saw what it looked like. We saw the people that were there. We saw, um, you know, the guys that we were around. So that's really what was the deciding factor. And then after that, honestly, you know, my mom was convinced, you know, it wasn't even really an option to go anywhere besides <laughs> it. It was just, sold. Yeah, yeah, it was more so just navigating, you know, how are we going to get by with this five hour plane ride from coast to coast. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, they were, they were honestly sold before I was sold to be honest with you. So, uh, it worked out and, uh, yeah, we, we all fell in love with the place. What about your buddies? Like some of your high school friends? Yeah. Well, I mean, similar situation. I mean, a lot of people from where, where I'm from, they just, you know, they didn't have that knowledge. You know, you get into that bubble of, you know, uh, a lot of people from my school went to the ECUs, uh, the UNCWs, the UNCs, Dukes, NC States, that local area that, you know, it wasn't much thought to the Stanford's, the USC, all the schools that were out West. But, you know, once the decision was made, I feel like, you know, a lot of people from the area were extremely supportive. Um, you know, they wanted for success. It, used to get people from that I went to high school with would tune into the game. So it was uh it, it was a good it was a good blend, man. A lot of people were were happy um just to you know just for me to have gone to the school and had the opportunity in the first place. So you get out to Sanford, twenty fifteen, your freshman season, you don't redshirt, which is actually pretty rare at Stanford, as yeah. I've, I've we've talked about on a couple of these episodes. It's not common. Mm -hmm. and, and as you get there in your running back room, you have 2015 season Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, you also yeah. Have plenty of other older, wise backs in that room. I mean, Daniel Marks. Yeah, um, yeah. Pat McFadden. Oh, right, on the yeah. stage. Poot Everyone yeah. loves Pootsie. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm missing others there too. Uh, yeah. But what was it like jumping into that that running back room as a freshman? And what was that first camp like and just the whole transition? It's a, it's a lot happening at once. Yeah, nah, I mean – we had a lot of, of vet leadership, you know what I mean? And we had a lot of people that weren't afraid to step up and lead the team and um, say what's on their mind and, you know, always back up and buy into what we were doing as a collective unit. And of course, you know, you know how special, you know, Christian was on the field, but everybody will always speak to the mentality that he had, the leadership uh, ability that he had. He kind of, um, you know, showed that grind showed that work and then we had the older guys too who had achieved a lot of amazing things as well uh ramon wright uh barry barry j barry sanders jr you know all that good stuff man so it was really just a, a good group collectively you know uh pat used to show me and cam you know just explain the offense to us you know break down protections um and all of that collectively allowed me really, honestly, the opportunity to go out there and compete in the first place to really figure out a way to add value to the team one way or another. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it, it, I really just always give credit to the older guys, give credit to, you know, Kevin Hogan, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ryan Burns, all those guys who were above us who 
had been to the places that we hadn't been to that ultimately led us to where we ended up being, which was Rose Bowl champs that year. So, yeah, not a, not a bad way to start. Yeah. And so, and before I even get into some of what went on that season in order to not redshirt and to show up and I mean, you show up in the summer and you're playing division one ball in September. Yeah. And you were just, just in high school a couple of months prior, yeah. you have yeah. to be, but you do have to be a certain level of ready physically for that type of thing. Yeah. Were you a weight room addict as a high schooler? Like yeah. how were you, how did you get so physically prepared that the, you know, the staff felt confident throwing you in there right off the bat? Yeah. So dang, I mean, so, uh, what I'll, what I'll throw it back to is in high school, not only, you know, my dad, uh, Coach Marshall, um, you know, my coaches on the football team, all that good stuff. But we had a, a personal trainer that really helped coach. His name was Coach Damien. Uh, so he coached myself, uh, Key, uh, my best friend, Marcus, Marcus Marshall, Naheem from time to time. He had a great group of just talented guys. And we used to go in there and we used to work uh, footwork, cutting, um, you know, really transferable things to the field. I was never, you know, we never really did crazy weight room. So, I mean, we did a lot of good things while I was, uh, in the high school weight room, but it wasn't ever really the, the big focus per se. Uh, so I was able to kind of, you know, I like to say that kind of worked to my benefit because I was able to have a strong foundation. And then, you know, Coach Turley and all those guys were able to kind of build upon it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, man, I, I mean, I, I'd say I attribute it to that. I mean, in terms of the mindset and the competition, you know, that's just, again, you know, being able to compete with the guys that were in my conference, being able to grow up competing with my brother, it kind of just bled into having that desire of, figuring out a way to contribute, you know what I mean? And then ultimately finding what skills were needed that could be filled uh, by me going into it. Well, it did not take you long to find a way to contribute. We were talking about before we started recording, you said you had maybe two or three touches, two or three runs maybe in the first game of your freshman season, which was at Northwestern. Second game of that season versus UCF in what, I think was your first ever reception. You take a screen pass 93 yards. Yeah. Yeah. No. Nah, so yeah, I'm trying, I don't remember the name of the play, but uh, I just remember we had practiced it all week. Um, and we just, I mean, it, it was the perfect play. I mean, Hogue put it on the money and it was just a straight shot. Wasn't really anybody there either, you know? So I just had to take advantage of it for sure. When you, br I mean, we, we'll, we'll get into how many, insane breakaway long distance runs you broke off in your Stanford career, but particularly yes. when it's your first one ever, you know, in your college career, you're a freshman, you're running down the sideline, 90 plus yards. Were you yes. a guy where when you're breaking out on a run like that, it's almost like you black out from adrenaline and you don't even remember what happened. Or is it actually, yes. when you think back to those, it's like pretty vivid. Yeah. I mean, it, all of them. Yeah. I mean, most of them are pretty vivid, especially that first one. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think that was big for me just, because, um, you know, it was a confidence booster, if nothing else. And I'm in sure. my mind, too, uh, I felt like it was a, just an opportunity to show myself and others that I could do this, that I, you know, kid from Wake Forest can transfer his skills to this level and, and have success one way or another. So, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely remember it for sure. I mean, there were, the to not jump ahead, but the 2017 season, I think you had – 13 runs over 50 yards so yeah, even I'm if like you have that. a vivid memory it might be tough to keep all all those memories straight but uh <laughs> just talk a little bit more i mean that season ends up with a rose bowl victory yeah how crucial was getting playing time that freshman year for your development dang i mean it was amazing to be honest with you i'll say that it was massive uh of course i think that it really put into perspective, like I said earlier, you know, just having that confidence, you know, people, it's hard to really even put a measuring stick on it, mm -hmm. but having that confidence to really build off of going into my sophomore year, uh, not only, you know, 
being able to have some success on the field, but also being able to sit back and seeing how guys like Christian prepare, seeing how, you know, the other running backs would come in and prepare on a day-to-day basis. Um, to study up with Cam, you know, even when we weren't in the building, really, it's hard to even put a number on it, to be honest with you. I think that's really one of the big things that came in. I want to say this was around the time that I had left, but the ability for guys to play in a little bit of games and then still have the opportunity to red shirt. I think that's, I mean, I think that's one of the best rules that they came up with, but it's it was an amazing experience and it really did contribute to my ultimate success for sure and so to to let people in on the the realities of stanford and being a student athlete at stanford a lot of yeah. programs and you probably know this from your you probably knew this at the time from your recruiting yeah. a lot of programs are like you come here here's the football building we'll set you up you're gonna have this yeah. apartment you're gonna be yeah, have it nah. made you'll live in the athletic dorms you'll have the athletic cafeteria stanford they take the yeah. opposite approach and they're like we don't care who you are you are yeah. living with a completely random fellow student you're not going to know who that student is until the first day of school like when you yeah. until move-in day until yeah. you see him face to face you could be anywhere on campus we don't care you might have a maybe a teammate or two in your dorm if you're lucky what yeah. were some of the uh, some of the realities of, of the? Sh- it's always a shock. So, what were some of the shocks yeah. that came with that freshman year experience? Nah. So, I mean, I'm gonna be honest. The one thing, or the big thing, from just how Stanford did it, and you know, you know, the dining hall and all that stuff. That was, you know, that that definitely was tough to get used to. I won't lie to you. <laughs> but the what the big thing that I was very grateful for that I thought was an amazing experience was the opportunity to uh, room up with someone that wasn't an athlete because it kind of gave you, you know, of course, going into it, you're nervous. You, you know, you at the SEC schools, all that other stuff, you're really going to just stick to your athlete bubble. And then that's just going to be it. But for me personally, having the opportunity to connect with my roommate, which is a good friend of mine, Miguel, uh, my hallmates, uh, Ravine, Chiamaka, Peace, all those people who were really instrumental to my time at Stanford and all contributed to really just making it a great experience. You know, I I can't say that not having that experience, I would have been able to build and foster those relationships for the most part. So that experience in itself was amazing. I love that we were able to do that. Um, Now the dining halls and all that stuff, now the dining halls, now it's a little bit different. Yeah, now it's different. Now, you know, they got a little bit more flexibility, but when I, you know, first year two years i mean we used to get out of practice dining halls would be closed yep. uh you know a lot of other stuff but you know thankfully a lot of that's changed now and you know the guys got the personal chef every now and then get to chop it up it got better too towards my junior and senior year but yeah man i mean it was the thing that i will say though is not having ac in the summertime it's tough i ain't gonna lie that's tough that's a, that's a tough transition tough. from all the yeah. in the south for sure that's a different reality nah, not, yeah it was, it was a different beast man yeah i mean <laughs> to me you know we only overlapped as one year one year as teammates but you seemed like one yeah. of these just you were one of these just hyper focused guys where to me i just figured you were all ball and all school i know you, you were a human biology major that's a serious time commitment on zone what did you yeah. like to do on campus like what was your way of chilling when you ever wanted to kind of relax and get away from football, get away from school. Yeah. Dang. So, I mean, my big thing was I used to just um, walk down. I'm trying to remember what road it was. Well, two things. So I used to go and get food with another one of my good friends. Her name is Anne Marie. Uh, she plays squash at Stanford. We used to go and get uh, this pokey food spot out in, um, I forget what the, the area is called. But it was right across the street from campus. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I forget town, what it town is. And country. Yes, town and country, town and yeah. country. Yeah, yeah. So town and country used to pull up over there. Uh, used to go to the library. I used to be in the library. And then uh, other than that, either just bike or walk across campus. Man, I mean, it was. It, I mean, it was. It is a beautiful place. Uh, and so yeah, man. You know, it, it was a it was a good balance. It was a good balance. You know, I I definitely um, enjoyed too. I mean, plus just going to the uh 
uh, locker room, kicking it with teammates. You know, we usually might have a game set up or something like that was uh, my big things for sure. So speaking of kind of balance and ways to stay grounded, not to gloss over the 2016 season, because that was a great year for you. And it was a wild one-two punch that we had Bryce Love yeah. and Christian yeah. McCaffrey in the same backfield. It's just a an embarrassment of riches in one backfield. Um, but following that year, you know, Christian leaves, you were the guy. What was going through your head when it was like, all right, this is RB1? Yeah, I mean, so for me, my big thing was, uh, you know, I had I had had a couple good springs, you know what I mean? Uh, being able to go out there and, you know, compete, of course, and do good things on the, the spring side. So mentally for me, it was just about getting in the, the physical shape to be able to do it. Uh, taking that mindset that I'd learned from Christian and other guys and the competition I had, I was going through, you know, with Cam to really be able to focus and be the best version of myself going out there. Um, I think, you know, that bleeds back to the earlier points we were talking about with just that experience in general. You know, I had had that experience. I, uh, you know, wasn't the guy, but I still had uh, opportunities to go out there and contribute and feel what it's like to be hit, feel what it's like to uh, break tackles and how fast the game was. And so by that time, you know, it was really just putting it all together, if nothing else, uh, really just taking advantage of the opportunity and just being in the moment, if nothing else, just being present and, you know, take what the defense gives you and just be me, you know, just go out there and be the best version of me that I could be. Sounds like, you totally felt ready. And a lot of the people I've spoken to, it's, it's not, it sounds like it's not rocket science, but it's harder when you're, when you're an athlete from just like the psychological level. But I think really good players are able to boil it down to look, if I'm yeah. prepared, if I've done the work, I really don't have a reason to be nervous or at least yeah. I have less yeah. reason to be nervous because, uh -huh. you know, I left no stone unturned in my preparation. So yeah. it's time to just go and put that yeah. to work. Is that kind of how you looked at it? Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, that's – we used to have the quote. I'm pretty sure Coach Turley used to have it on the, the training news. But uh, just when, you know, preparation meets opportunity, you know, you're good to go. There's yeah. nothing else. Uh, you know, you can lay your hat on the fact that you did all that you could do and you prepared to the maximum ability. You trained as hard as you could train and, you know, let the chips fall where they do. But yeah, so I mean, it, it was it was one of those situations where in my mind, I was going to study all that I could study. I was going to, you know, watch as much film as I could watch. I was going to wake up early. I was going to train. I mean, you know, me and uh, Q Meeks, uh, Quentin Meeks, mm -hmm. we used to uh, be on the field together, just doing anything, catching passes from the QBs, uh, doing one-on-ones on, you know, Saturdays with Jay, uh, Justin Reed. and just having all that really uh, come together and, you know, just mix at the perfect time was just extremely beneficial. So when we got to that 2017 season, it took you five games to get to a thousand yards rushing. Yeah. 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 With one that, totally I, unforgettable I, game in particular against Arizona state where it was just, it was uh, video game numbers. It was insane. It was, I think you ran for 300 something yards. It was every, couple minutes you were breaking off a you know 40 plus yard run when yeah. in that season because there's a I would assume there's a difference where you're thinking okay you know I've stacked a couple of good games here I guess it's good to was there ever a moment where I just clicked where you were thinking wait this is this is like really a different level yeah. I'm on to something here yeah nah so I mean I it's it's crazy I guess when I when I rationalize it I kind of just Think about it in the same way of how Christian went through the 2015 season. You know, uh, of course, you know, it's obviously, you know, I felt the same way because I'm on the sidelines. I'm watching him do all the things that he's doing. And, you know, you'll see him the next day you know, around campus or in film study. And it's just, you know, another day. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like he had a great game, but he's still prepping and going through it, looking at the next opponent. And it was really that that same way. I mean, I obviously, you know, I grew up playing NCAA, but even towards the end of the year, like I didn't realize 
for example, like when the finalists and stuff were going to be named or where the award show was at or when it was going to be. So I was just mentally thinking, you know, this was this was a great game, but flush it on to the next, you know, and just thinking of what I can do to help us win some games, what I can do better, what I can do to grow. And, you know, also at that point in time, uh, Coach Gould had came in as well, and he was a big reason for the success. But he also, you know, his experience with having successful running backs too really put it in perspective um, as well. So I felt like my duty was to to know that I had to make it and that I was being the best version that I could be for the person next to me, the people that were counting on me as an offensive unit as well. So, uh, so yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of a weird feeling, you know, especially looking back on it now, but, uh, mentally it's just a, a different mindset, man. You know, it's a, it's a long season and things can ultimately change. So, uh, yeah, just taking it game, game by game for me was the best thing that I could have done. Were you someone who ever got nervous? Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously I always would lay my hat on the preparation and stuff that, that I did, but you know, of course, before the first hit, you know, you're always going to have a little, be a little bit jittery, be a little bit nervous. Um, I think that just, that's, that's a good thing just because, you know, it helps you be more focused, uh, be mentally in a better spot than, uh, you know, just going in too relaxed, you know, it's still, it's still a balance at the end of the day, but you know, there are definitely some times where I was nervous for sure. I mean, your demeanor, though, it's just like silent assassin. I, no one would no one would have known, I don't think, if you were extremely nervous or if it was just another day. But um, <laughs> did you have any kind of pregame rituals? A lot of guys like to do things a certain way before the game, aside from the standard preparation, just to get their mind yeah. right. Dang. So, I mean, my thing was uh, – so I, I tried to do smelling sauce one time, but my nose started to bleed. So I had to, I had to tap out, you feel me? But uh, – Besides that, I did. Uh, I was really just reviewing the notes and stuff for the most part. So, um, I kind of put my mind at peace, just kind of quizzing myself in my own head, like, okay, you know, I know this, I know this, I know to look for this, I know to look for this. Um, obviously, you know, playing the music, whatever music I was listening to at the time. What was your go-to music? Dag, back in those days, shoot, I ain't gonna lie, probably, probably like Friday Night Lights, J. Cole. Okay. Back in the, you know what I'm saying? I had been listening to that since high school. So yeah. that was using my pregame tunes. And yeah, so I mean, I tried to, like, like we just mentioned in that last question, try to have that best balance of, you know, nerves, but also that kind of peaceful, like, oh, okay, you know, I've done this before. Uh, I know what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, everything about whoever I'm playing against. And yeah, so just kind of hanging my hat on that. Speaking of knowing knowing everything about everyone you're playing against, tell people yeah. this is another thing that until I was in a college football locker room, I had no idea the level of detail. Tell people yeah. about like a scouting report that you're provided with and that you're, you know, oh, expected yeah, yeah, yeah. to study exactly. going into a game week uh, yeah, with your so entire I mean opponent broken down. Yeah, nah. So I mean, my my big thing was, and I, you know, I think for a lot of people, just that jump from high school to college is massive. I mean, and of course, you know, in high school, at least where I'm from, we had not necessarily general quote unquote scouting, but it wasn't a whole dedicated team to it. You know what I mean? That you have in college. So of course, when you get to college, you know, you're gonna know names. You're gonna know that D coordinator's favorite plays is you're going to, at least for us, we're going to know his blitz package. We were going to know, um, you know, what coverages they like to run. And then beyond that too, we had to know, and that's the benefits to the pro style that we ran was we had to not only know what we were going to kill the play for, we had to know what we would alert the play for. Um, so it was a, it was a lot. It was a lot. I mean, my and that's a big thing that Coach G again really spoke to us and taught us and coached us up on was that understanding led to control. So, you know, his big thing was to get on the board and draw out different plays, uh, draw out why we would alert the ripcord, draw out um, you know, when we're gonna get two doubles backside, you know what I mean? Whatever scheme is gonna be. But 
and ultimately that contributed a massive amount. But to your point, yeah, the the scouting, the level of detail is tremendous. It's it's a jump, absolutely. Even down to uh, you know, a, a good example that I have for details was when we used to run or the screenplay that I used to run my freshman year, it had to be two steps forward and then come straight back down the line. You know what I mean? And if it wasn't, then the, if the timing was off by a step, then the whole play could be ruined. Maybe the ball would be behind, in front, above, you know, because people are pulling, Ho can't hold that ball, but for mm-hmm. too long. So it's just, it's so much that goes in goes into it uh, that people probably don't even realize on a day-to-day. So uh, especially for running backs, I mean, you know, you got to run, catch, block, all that good stuff. So, yeah. So I was talking a little bit more about pregame and preparation. One yeah. thing I, I wonder about with guys who are having a season of, of that caliber, who is playing at your level and getting so much media attention, the fans are obsessing over you. Did you, like, if you'd have a great game, were you ever watching SportsCenter? Were you ever checking Twitter? <laughs> were you kind of acknowledging like okay this is pretty good i'm gonna take a moment or did you try to just zone it all out nah so i mean the big times where i, I mean i was never really a, a a tweeter but anytime i would make an instagram post i just noticed that i would get a bunch of you know likes engagement comments and that's kind of you know what started to put it in perspective mm-hmm. but yeah you know i wasn't really big on like uh sports center and all that stuff so i mean i knew from you know people talking to me about it about uh you know how good of a season and all that good stuff and how things were uh looking good i guess for the most part but you know i think also this kind of bleeds back to that stanford point i think one of the beautiful things about stanford as well is the environment that you're in really contributes to um that level of success putting it in perspective if nothing else um you know you have classes with olympians you know you'd have classes with renowned world renowned professors and on top of that too you know a lot of people weren't you know over the moon about going to the games so you know there were there were opportunities where you know just going around campus uh you know you were able to just be you you were able to just kind of be one of the people on campus so you didn't really have that kind of interaction that you might have if you had gone to alabama or auburn or you know sec school for the most part so um i say that that perspective and all that good stuff really just helped the whole experience and besides the instagram interactions it wasn't really anything too crazy yeah no it is wild that you could be on your way to pac 12 offensive player of the year about to be a heisman finalist and a lot of campus Reality is doesn't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that, that's the beauty of Stanford, man. I mean, like like I said, man. I mean, they're they're everybody who's who's there was doing something amazing in their own way. You know what I mean? Um, so you know, anybody you might just be walking past, maybe like I said, an Olympian, a well accomplished, or had has been published in multiple papers, whatever it is, you know what I mean? Everybody was amazing in their own regard. So just having that in itself, just kind of just, you know, put everything in perspective. Like I said earlier, Trent was talking about it. He's like, it's kind of hard to get, get a big, too big of a head when you have a nice game, but then you go into class on Monday and you're sitting next to Katie Ledecky. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. You know, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough for, for for perspectives, man. It's just it's not even you know on the same level, man. But I, I I do feel trend on that. He's right. Crazy. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about getting towards the Heisman and mm-hmm. how did you get notified? How does that actually work? Is there just one day that you get a phone call and they say from whoever the committee is, someone picks yeah. up the phone and says, "Hey, Bryce Love, you're a Heisman finalist. Here's your invite to New York." Yeah. Nah, so I mean, I think um, honestly, I I think I was just kind of well, I was just on campus or something. I don't remember what exactly I was doing. I don't remember getting a phone call or anything like that. But I remember kind of walking into the locker room, and um, you know, they had had the rerun, I guess, of the show or something like that, and seeing it up there, and yeah, I mean, that that was my big thing. That and then also, I of course, you know, Twitter as well, but um. 
yeah, I mean, once once that started coming in, it really started to hit me, really started to put things in perspective. And then, so when you get to that weekend, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, a lot of celebrations outside of the actual award night. What's it like? Yeah. Walk us through it. Dag, well, you know, I, I was out there with, uh, you know, Baker and Lamar, and they're both great guys, had great families that were out there with them. So for me, it was one of those moments that, it was so surreal that it didn't even necessarily feel real for the most part. Yeah. Uh, in retrospect, of course, you know, it was, it was a great opportunity. It was an amazing experience. It was great people. Um, but when I was in the moment, you know, it didn't necessarily hit me of the gravity of what I was experiencing until afterwards, you know what I mean? And uh, even to this day, you know, thinking back on, you know, being able to say that I was there and to, I've sat in that row and all that good stuff was, uh, you know, a testament to the guys that I played with, the guys that I, you know, contrib- that contributed to me throughout my career. So, so yeah, man, it was a surreal experience. Yeah, and Baker Mayfield ended up winning the award that year. Yeah. Yep. And yep. Uh, but you had won the Doak Walker Award for the best running back in the country. Yeah. Um, yep. I mean, that's that's a pretty amazing award to to have on your shelf for the rest of your life. So as that season is coming to a close and you're getting all these awards and all these accolades and your stats are off the charts, what is the communication with NFL scouts, potential agents? Like, I know that there are people who will be in the ears of players like you saying, Hey, just so you know, this is where you're projected. This is what you, you know, this is what you're going to have to do if you declare, like, how does that actually work behind the scenes? Yeah. So, I I mean, I had, um, I want to say, that uh, my folks had kind of had some interviews here and there, just connecting with folks. Uh, I don't think I was able to have any interactions just because I didn't, you know, end up declaring or anything like mm-hmm. that. But I mean, mainly just having conversations with Coach Shaw, man, you know, about his perspectives on different things and um, weighing different things out uh, for the most part. But yeah, I mean, mainly just interviews and trying to figure out, you know, the right fit and all that good stuff. And so ultimately determined. You had unfinished business at Sanford on the academic side and athletic side, you know, wanting to come back and play for a Pac-12 championship. And not to mention you were working towards a degree in home bio, human biology at Stanford. So, yeah. Talk a little bit about just the thought process there and, and what went into it. Yeah. So, I mean, really, you, you kind of hit it on the head. You know, I really wanted, you know, we ended up losing uh, a handful of games that 2017 year and coming back. You know, I really wanted to at least go after more of the, you know, to leave that kind of legacy for the teammates that were coming up behind me. So, you know, we had a a great team. Ultimately, you know, it didn't end up working out how we wanted it to work out. But that was my big mindset, that as well as going after that degree and uh, being able to graduate and all that good stuff uh, really led to it. And so I think you dealt with injury throughout that year. I don't know if it was Mm -hmm. an ankle or yeah no yeah so it was more so yeah it was ankle um did that i want to say notre dame uh ankle and then some i think it was like growing to something like that too so it was just it was a lot going on that year uh of course you know it was a tough year Mm -hmm. but you know there's still a lot of positives and learning experiences that were taken away from it especially in regards to perseverance oh yeah um still seeking that knowledge still being that that leader, uh, even when not necessarily contributing. Uh, so yeah, I'll say that. Talk a little bit about your leadership style. I mentioned that you're kind of a, you know, definitely a quiet guy leading by example, but how mm-hmm. would you describe it? Yeah, so I mean, my that was my big thing, man. Really um, showing up and showing what it necessarily took on a day-to-day basis to achieve the things that we wanted to achieve. Uh, of course, you know, going through the day-to-day grind, uh, showing up early, uh, you know, staying late to watch the film, uh, and really taking the time to, you know, be able to lead and show that type of example to the younger group as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and so as that, you know, that, that was applied, as you said, when you were the best running back in the nation, lighting it up for your teammates. And also when you're dealing with injury and you're having to just contribute that leadership from the sideline. Like the reality is when you're hurt, 
you're still the leader. People are still going to look to Bryce Love on, on yeah. how to be around the program and, and would still look at you as that leader. Yeah. And so as that year comes to a close, there's another injury. Yeah. Where yeah. It's the last game of the year, the last game of your career, <laughs> and it's an ACL. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that that's devastating. Like that's I think that given that you're such a well rounded person, I'm mm -hmm. sure that it wasn't as devastating for, you know, your identity as it would be for other people. Yeah. But still that that hurts. So what was going through your mind during that time? Yeah. So I mean, you kinda hit it on the head. So it, it was uh it was a tough moment for sure. Uh, you know, I leaned to, you know, my mom, my family, they were out there as well. Leaned into into that. Um, you know, we did win, end up winning the game, so we got the axe. We were mm -hmm. playing cow, so that's let it live. That's we, important. We that, but if nothing else, do you feel me? But um, yeah, so it was definitely one of those moments where uh, you know, it was it was tough to go through, and even through the recovery and the rehab experience, just having to have that that mindset. You know what I mean? Even taking steps away from football, learning other passions, learning other um, things that I was interested in and wanted to pursue. All, all of that really helped uh, through that experience. But definitely at that point in time, it was, it was a tough moment. It was a tough experience. And um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was tough to go through. But at the same time, I feel like the things that I've taken away from it have really uh, outshined that aspect of it for sure. Yeah, I mean... An injury like that on the you know the last carry at Stanford, yeah, it's 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 brutal. Like there's no yeah. there's no two ways around it. It's brutal, and it takes a ridiculous amount of perseverance to move on from that. And that held you out of the combine, right? That held you, yeah, yeah, pro day. I mean, all these things that were slated, and I'm sure on your calendar, change of plans, yeah. Yep. And, you know, you mentioned you leaned on your family and of course you had specific work to do on the rehab front. The reality is you got to try to get better. Yeah. What were the months between, you know, November when that Kyle Stanford game is and the NFL draft in the end of April, what were those yeah. months like? Just tell, talk about it in your own words. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, I'd say just the rehab at anybody who's gone through ACL knows how tough that rehab aspect of it was as well so my big thing you know the acl was the acl but my meniscus is what really took the most time um and so really working to get that or trying to get that range to a point that it was acceptable if nothing else and so a lot of you know range of motion tasks a lot of uh bfr a lot of um you know, multiple day sessions, all that, that grind day to day, the pool work, all that stuff really. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, it was really a, a daily grind, if nothing else, uh, especially my battle with uh, like range of motion is uh, yeah. So it, it was, it was tough. I mean, it was tough, especially going through that and also balancing, uh, you know, still having to travel to the combine mm -hmm. for the uh, health evaluations. I uh, still have to talk with different teams. So you have to do all that good stuff to try to still try to put yourself in that in the best best position that you can be uh ultimately for the draft. Uh so it was it was a tough experience. I was down in Pensacola though. I had a, a good group of guys, you know, that were uh, you know, helping my need to the best of their abilities. And uh yeah, so it, it was a it was definitely a, a time of, of balancing a lot of different things. So you go to the combine anyway. Yeah. And every NFL coach knows, every NFL scout knows exactly who you are. You're the most electric player in college football one yeah. year prior. They're, they know Bryce Love. But they also realize Bryce Love is hurt and he's not mm -hmm. running the 40 and he's not doing three cones and he's not, you know, showing all this explosive uh, part of his game right in front of them there in Indianapolis. So yeah. a big part of the combine is interviews and just sitting down and they want to get to know who this person is. What were the questions like? What were those interviews like, given the circumstances? Dang. Uh, dang. I mean, it was, I didn't have really no crazy questions. I mean, my big things were all more so knowledge-based. You know, like we would um, watch film and talk about, you know, why we would get to this scheme or why, uh, what protection we were running or why, uh, you know, why 
they might have decided to give us a blitz or whatever it was. You know what I mean? So my thing was definitely more board work oriented, kind of just showing off that, that I had a deeper understanding of the offense, that I um, knew the different schemes, that I understood why the overall why of what what we were getting to. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it was, you know, I, you know, I enjoyed going through and doing stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, I didn't really get any crazy questions. You know, I'd be hearing some of the crazy stuff that folks be getting, but yeah, for the most part, mine were pretty, pretty tame, pretty relaxed. So April comes, the draft comes, you end yeah. up fourth round Washington yeah. mm -hmm. and you're still on the rehab front, right? It's still, you still got to get better. Yeah. Yeah. How, how does that transition work where now it's just, okay, I'm going to get to know this Washington training staff and they're going to get me over yeah. the finish line and, and we're going to get back to work. Like where was your mind uh, during those months? Yeah. So uh, similar, similar to what you said, I, I was able to come into a solid group of, of, of staff that were willing and able to work. And of course, you know, you get access to more resources for the most part uh, by being with the NFL team. So I kind of, was able to get my staple uh, or stable of workouts, a stable of rehab equipment, and then a plan in the weight room and training room to really be able to get back in shape, to keep getting that range of motion as good as I can, to be able to run, cut, jump. And, uh, you know, we still took it slow. It was a process. It was a journey. Uh, had a couple different staffs come in. But, yeah, yeah, so it was still just that focus on grinding and focus on being uh, – the best version of myself that I could be. I want to hear you tell your side of the story of just what has gone on from arriving in Washington to now. Like, I want to hear it in your own words. Yeah, no, I mean, so for the most part, I mean, it just was still always just a battle, battle with uh, my knee. So it was one of those situations where, you know, it wasn't getting to where it needed to get. And even to this day, you know, I still train, I still do field work and all that good stuff. But, you know, it's still it's still that still that battle for the most part. So, uh, you know, I, but at the same time, like I mentioned to the earlier question that you asked me, finding other passions and doing different stuff like that. And so that's been one of my big things. I mean, we talked off camera about um, investing and angel investing and working with different startups. And that's been the majority of the things that I've been doing. Um, but yeah, you know, the love that I have for the game is never going to go away. So, you know, I always leave a little bit of that door open if, you know, if it does get right or, you know, some thing changes or some new thing comes out, you know, I'm definitely not opposed to an opportunity or to keep chasing after it. It's just, you know, it's one of those things, man. It's one of those things that's, that's a battle that, you know, it's, it's unfortunate because I definitely do want that opportunity to go out there and compete and do those things but um yeah you know if nothing else being able to stay on that journey and and keep discovering what's out there and all that good stuff has been extremely fun and and fulfilling yeah i mean that's just life throwing a curveball you know yeah yeah you know what i mean being able to react and being able to adjust and and go through it has been uh, been a journey in itself for sure. A lot of what they talk about in, in Stanford recruiting and about Stanford football and Stanford athletics broadly, yeah, the the kind of cliche like you're making a forty year decision, not a four year decision. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, just like even talking to you today, it's like your identity is not stuck in being a running back. Like life is yeah. a lot broader than that for for you. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean. uh yeah, life life happens, man. You got to be able to adjust. You got to be able to adapt. Uh, and you know, we had a, a speaker in one of the classes that I was I was a part of, and his big thing was, "Are you just passionate about this, or are you a passionate person in general?" Uh, so being able to, like I said, be on that journey to discover the different things that are out there, uh, to learn, to to grow, to be a better version and to take those same lessons that I've had from football and the experiences that I've had to bleed into who I am today. Um, it's, it's been great, man. It's, it's a lot out there and it's a lot of great things out there as well. And it's been, it's been fun to go through it. I mean, it's also kind of amazing how much of how many of the like 
the lessons that are downstream of what happens on the field that you learn oh, yeah, yeah. from yeah. competing at yeah. that high of a level and being in mm -hmm. a weight room and being accountable and being on a team. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, that prepares you more than any, than any standalone class could, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, everything at the end of the day happens for a reason, you know what I mean? And there is lessons in everything that folks go through. So yeah, it's, it's like you said, it's so much that uh, obviously, you know, you take a lot from football and the lessons that you can learn through football, but uh, being able to apply them to life, being able to learn the other lessons that are out there as well uh, is, is also fulfilling in itself. Who was your favorite coach you ever played for? Dang, that's tough. So, I mean, I, I, I couldn't say one. I'm going to be honest with you. I say, for one, I definitely say Coach G. Well, I'll, yeah, Coach G, Coach Shaw, I mean, Coach Bloom. Uh, I'd say, you know, it, it's I could go down the list of my high school coaches as well. But I would probably say the number one would probably be my dad, above all else. You know what I mean? Just because he's the one who taught me the foundational things that ultimately led to being able to be put in all those different situations in general. Uh, you know, and he was the first one. He was the one, you know, we used to wake up early. We'd go to the field. We'd play catch. We'd run around. We, um, you know, even my first actual coach, he was the head coach to the flag football team, to the uh, Mighty Might team. Uh, so he definitely was the one who deserves his flowers in that regard. I'll say that. What was your favorite way to celebrate a win? Ooh, to celebrate a win. I say with my teammates uh, and then go to sleep. <laughs> a mix, a blend. What was your favorite away stadium to play in in college? Dang. Uh, I said the Coliseum. Coliseum, USC. What was your least favorite away stadium? Ooh, that, that's 1A, 1B, Washington State. And Oregon State. What's the worst weather game you ever played in? Oh, Washington. Oh, okay. If, it, if we're not talking college, I ever, would say. Ever, all time. Okay. So I say a toss up between in high school, we played um, the Barrios brothers. So that's Braxton, Austin Barrios. Um, this is, I want to say, like 20. Oh, this is like 20. 12 or somewhere my freshman year 2012 2013 it was one of those games where the older guys say we don't wear sleeves and you go out there with no sleeves and it's like 10 degrees outside but they are playing and you and you're just standing on the sideline so <laughs> i say i say probably that uh or that same situation except like pop warner football way way back in the day young kid days why human biology why that major Ooh, so i i always grew up just being passionate about, uh, you know, the human body, passionate about doctors. Uh, one of the big stories that I always used to tell was when I was young and having pneumonia and the physician coming in and getting healed and all that good stuff and wanting to follow in that footsteps. Um, that's really, you know, started the love, it continued and it's still there to this day. What is the most vivid memory from a play or a moment during your run at Stanford? Most vivid memory. I'd say winning the Rose Bowl. Yeah, we're either winning the Rose Bowl or winning that Pac-12 championship. What was the most difficult element of training at Stanford? Oh, the rope. That's easy. Either the rope or five-minute versa climber. Okay. Yeah, specific. Okay. I guess people don't know about what the rope is, though. So, I mean. Yeah, well, tell them. Yes, I mean, the rope is basically, um, so you have a long rope and you have you know, it's tug of war style. You can't cross the line. It's just you pulling the rope, but you'll have five or six other people holding the end of the rope with somebody tied in. So the theme is that you can only take what they give you, but you got to keep fighting at the end of the day. So you gas out the first 30 seconds or something like that. But then the next, you know, 10, 15 minutes, you still just have to keep fighting, keep pulling, keep fighting. And your first one is usually the worst. So they call it like the freshman rope. and. uh so, yeah, the older guys from your position group will usually get on it, and it's tough. Yeah, Versa Climber is just five-minute Versa is just five-minute Versa Climber. Okay. Would you ever want to get into coaching? 
Dag, it's crazy. I was just talking to to Keller about this. Uh, I I would down the line for sure. I would down the line for the right the right thing. I mean, I'm like I said, the love for football never goes away. You know what I mean? And you know, on the side, I'm happy to do you know just watch film, go through stuff like that, all that good stuff. I just watch film anyway, all twenty two tape, whatever it is. Uh, I just do that in my free time, just just to stay up to date and you know keep keep that football mindset intact. But yeah, no, I'm not opposed. One day, I won't fight it. What's one piece of advice that 26 year old Bryce Love would give to 16 year old Bryce Love? I'd say um, to ah dang, what would I say? I'd say something along the lines of to foster uh relationships and keep in touch and all that good stuff i think one of the big things from my stanford experience that uh i was so obsessed with football and i was so you know passionate about sports and figuring out how i could be better or you know how i could do something different on this play or whatever it was that i didn't necessarily take the time to you know build those relationships build those connections build uh, take advantage of what was really there, if nothing else. Uh, so I say something along those lines. Just either that or be patient, enjoy the journey. All right. Well, Bryce, thank you so much. I it was such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, just like it's so you're such an inspiring story and such a stand. I mean, a college football legend, without question. And uh, I definitely wish you nothing but the best and your whatever endeavors lie ahead whatever life throws at you i'm not uh i'm not too concerned about your ability to handle them so thanks again hey man i appreciate you having me brent thank you it's been great awesome